Good afternoon, friends. I'd like to welcome you today to What's in Tegan's Storage Locker. It's the show that dares to ask the question, just what is in my storage locker? The answer today, as uh, pretty much every day, it's comic books. Oh, and... I <laughs> well, now you're going to think that I trained him to do that. No, that was just his absolutely impeccable sense of timing. What more can I say about it? Um, so, yes, welcome to the show. Um, I grab a pile of comics from, you know, not just my storage unit stuff, I, well, stuff I put in the storage unit more recently, stuff from the other storage unit, basically uh, storage units in general as a concept. Um, so, uh, before we get started today, I just want to say, um, I'm really pleased by the reception to the show so far in terms of the views and such. Um, I don't put a lot of advertising up, but I do put some. Um, so I need you to help me grow the show if you can by, if you enjoy it, telling other people about it, passing the links around. Um, that's what, that's what we need to do here. And the Patreon, you know, it's there for people who, who like the show and maybe want to support it more, maybe want to see more episodes, maybe want to see me buy an actual microphone instead of just using the microphone on the iPhone app because it sounded worse when I tried it with the microphone that I could afford at the time. What I really need to do is I need to get a cat center for when I record. But then half of you would probably stop watching. So anyway, yes, check out the Patreon. Tell all your pals about the show. He's telling me that I need to get with it. Um, I'm not going to put a bunch of ad start putting a bunch of advertisements, but um, maybe I might mention the Patreon once in a while. Uh, not just keeping it towards the end of the show. Uh, so, where were we? All right, Warheads number one. My goodness, this, this, my friends, is a very interesting comic book. This is, a, you know, a very obscure Marvel series from 92. Yeah, July 1992. Um, and it was part of a, a subline of, of comic books that Marvel got back... Uh, in the early 90s because they were putting out a lot of comic books. They were putting out a lot more epic books for a little while. They were um, just, you know, if anything did sort of well, and, um, you know, Death's Head had always been, um, always been a respectably popular character, never enough to have his own book in the States, but Death's Head 2 kind of changed that. That was, I think, my, my recollection is that Death's Head 2 was sort of the catalyst because out of nowhere Marvel just had this had this book appear on their doorstep which which looked kind of wild in a way that um, seemed both contemporary but also a little bit different and the fact is a lot of these books got lumped in as well stuff Marvel put out in the in the glut years stuff um, of little or no value like frankly you know a lot of Marvel's mainline um, just not a memorable period for all that many of their books. So, you know, it might be easy to dismiss these, but the thing is, here's the thing. Um, lately, I, I've been going back and, and picking up um, the more choice runs of these books when I come across them in quarter bins or, you know, on a discount day at the, the back issue shop. Um, that's another thing we're doing. We're working on the ums. I'm going to try to nip him in the butt. I was on the radio for years. I was a teacher for years. I don't remember. I don't think I said, I think I got rid of the habit when I was teaching. I want to say. Maybe I can do that again. Um, <sighs> ah, we do have our fun here, don't we? So, anyway, what I was saying is, it's unfair to dismiss these books. I've, I've really come to the understanding. Because, yes, they were pushed out by Marvel. 
at a glut period when Marvel was putting out. You have no interest in any of this. Well, the little man is feeling his oats. I may need to go play with him with a squeaky toy at some point if, if he doesn't calm down. Um, oh, geez. See what I mean? It was driving me nuts when I was re-watching one of the older videos the other day. Just pulled it up by random. And it really got to me like, it didn't used to be that bad. When I was on the radio, I, I was good about it. Uh, you get old, you just, you know. So anyway, the point being, um, uh, you know, the fact that it, the fact that I'm making note of it now, hopefully that'll, that'll allow me to kick it. Uh, yes, we can. But just the fact that Marvel was putting out a lot of comics has nothing to do with the genesis of these books, which is that Marvel inexplicably found themselves sort of kind of in possession um, of an exclusive talent pool that they had spent years inculcating in Britain. Um, they had an actual presence. It wasn't a big presence, but they had an office. They produced some material inside the country, not all of which even made it over here. The Captain Britain stuff has been reprinted, but the... Um, Oh, God, I can't even remember that name. Night Mask, I think. No, Night Mask was the new universe. I can't even remember his name, and I have the book just like two feet from my foot. Uh, really good. So they had a bunch of people uh, who drew like they grew up reading 2000 AD instead of Uncanny X-Men. And in terms of the 1990s, that was actually really interesting. But most of this material just went completely under the radar. I remember at the time looking at the bullpen bulletins checklist and seeing lists of names for all these titles. I never saw them. They never made it to the newsstand. And uh, the stands were really just, they were crowded at that point. And in hindsight, you can look back and see, wow, this, this set of artists, uh they really got the short end of the stick in terms of uh, being pushed out on a market that was, was maybe set to implode, shall we say. And an underperforming uh, wing of Marvel Comics that wasn't but two years old at the time. Um, yeah, it's going to drive me nuts. It's going to drive me nuts. I know it's breaking up the flow, but I, I gotta beat myself with this habit. Okay. What was I saying? Anyway. So we got a comic with a Wolverine guest appearance on it, but nothing else about this comic looks in any way like a Marvel comic. There's even a character here who's wearing a hat that says... Now, it says, I think, cool puck, or maybe they just didn't catch it, or there's a kerning mishap, but it's not, that's not what it reads as, and this just went right out the front door in 1992, because that's how much material they were publishing, I guess. No one was paying attention to make sure that, you know, the, the British people didn't do something that, uh, <laughs> uh, Gary Erskine, if you're wondering, if you've been looking at it all this time and wondering, your answer is Gary Erskine. So you see, there's a lot more word balloons on the page than you were getting probably even by 1992. Although there were certainly lots of holdovers on that. But it looks really packed. Just the fact that these new characters are being introduced all in a, um, a single page. You know, if this were 2000 AD, they could do that in half the page, right there. Introduce one, two, three, four, five, six, seven new characters. That, that's half a page. Anything more and you're just dawdling, mate. <laughs> and these characters don't look like Marvel characters. They don't, they don't have costumes in any identifiable fashion. They just sort of have a, a theme to their look, uh, you know, various 
armor, techno armors, and this woman's walking around in her underwear with, you know, real interesting makeup. It's just an odd-looking set of characters in, in the best way for a Marvel comic book. And this did nothing. This, this book, it sank without a stone. No one in 1992 was paying any attention to Gary Erskine. Or, you know, maybe if people did read this book, it just got filed away because this stuff isn't talked about. You never see a lot of uh, retrospective about this era of Marvel UK. But I, I think there's some gold here. I have no idea what this reads like. Who's, who's writing this, this gin joint here? This is uh, Nick Vince with John Beeston on colors. And it does look like sort of a, a non, I don't know. American comics were, per, were still colored a certain way. And this, this kind of sticks out. Who's coloring that? John Beeston. It really does. I mean, it looks, wow, look at this. Look at how good this looks. Wow, this is a nice comic book. You better grab this comic book for someone with a lot more clout than me, like, bites it. Um, it's just, wow, this is all stuff that was really big at the time. Dudes walking around with huge guns, but, like, the munitions are weird to describe. It's like... They look like they belong in a Judge Dredd strip more than they belong in a Rob Liefeld strip. And that, uh, that wasn't necessarily something uh, that you could say for a lot of books at the time, although... Uh, oh, so this is a flashback. This is like to 1989, because that's the last time they were in the, re the, the Outback base. Look at the coloring on this. This is just a nice-looking comic book. And people, people were paying no attention to any anything that happened in this line of books at the time. And they never used most, uh, you know, a couple of these characters, I think, have shown up for this or that or the other, you know, over the years. But the bulk of them, even though they're right there, have just, you know, never been used. I, I've certainly never seen these guys show up for anything else. They're interesting. This is definitely, I mean, look at all these shell casings. And, you know, these little tiny panels with lots of, you, you can see full figures and small panels with full backgrounds. That's, and it reads remarkably clear for all that, even though there's an immense amount happening on the page. Now, it's decompressed some, I think, from 2000 AD, especially old, the older 2000 uh, AD. The newer, you know, when you pick up a new issue of 2000 AD, it's not always so micro-jam-packed. Um, as they used to be, where it's like they had three comic books and then they brought an elephant over to sit on them, so it's only one comic book. <laughs> uh, wow, and you know, this is kind of a wonky Wolverine. Sort of, it's taken a lot from, I mean, a lot from Barry Windsor Smith. Um, Erskine is just kind of going for it as far as that is concerned. And these color, I mean, look at all these different shades of blue and green. That's not stuff, this isn't stuff Marvel was doing at the time. You had to be looking at DC's, you know, Mondo paper books for color of this interesting. Wow, this is a great book. Um, uh, there we go. But look at, look at this sense of color and this, this, this interesting action sequence through a nine panel grid. You know, this seems like, all right, maybe this isn't going to make sense. This seems like something you'd see in a Wildstorm comic in, in five years. This is anticipating that uh, post-image mood that Wildcats gets after, I mean, you know, the Alan Moore Wildcats, but, the, you know, he wasn't the only crater to take on that era. But there's cyborgs, there's the guy with claws. And this is colored more like a British comic book. Wow, look at this. Although I say that and then I realize, oh, uh, well, those don't particularly look like caricatures, but I don't know, this weird looking guy in a vizier's costume, he doesn't seem like a very... Uh, 
uh, trustful fellow. I, I wouldn't necessarily trust him to hold my wallet. Nice. Uh, wow, this is just such a nice comic book. Uh, oh my goodness. My goodness, how was no one paying attention to this? Wizard wasn't talking about this. I was reading Wizard religiously in 1992. You know, that I have to be true to my school. I was paying attention to what you were supposed to pay attention to in terms of uh, that kind of uh, comic book art, and this was nowhere. 1992 was the summer of image. No one was really paying any attention to uh, these weird British comics. You know, Liam Sharp possibly accepted. He had a little bit of heat. Um, but look at this, Gary Erskine. Although there's, a little, there's someone in their underwear, no code. <laughs> yeah, no comics code in 1992. Uh, yeah, events in Warheads Jump take place when the X-Men were believed dead and living in secret in Australia. Okay, it's just, man, this is a nice looking comic book. I think I'm going to do this on the TikTok channel. That's how nice this is. Oh, this weird, see, I told you, that guy's got one of those things on the ground. It's never a good thing when any dude... Right, does that on the ground and then invites you in. You're always going to end up doing some shit. Whoa. Oh, man. Look at this. Look at this. This this is fantastic. And, and then you go over here. This was the ad that ran in all the books for years telling you what was hot. Even if you were completely tuned out. You could just check this ad that ran in all the comics and see what they were pushing. And this is a Marvel book, so I, I think they probably were pushing more Marvel stuff. But that, you know, Bat uh, Batman, uh, DC, the, and Dark Horse. Dark Horse is starting to come into the conversation with the first uh, Star Wars uh, series they were doing, which is just Star Wars 3 and 4. That's how new Star Wars was back to comics, which is you know, also something that happened in those boom years. Probably not a, you know, not a small number of people uh, bought comics for the first time in years because of those. They were doing the RoboCop sequels at that point. Miller was involved in some of those with the comic side. And you never see any... I mean, and this is just like new Marvel books. It's like New issue of Captain America, Dark Hawk Annual, and you don't even see any of these UK books. You see this whole, they were pushing Ghost Rider in 1992. They weren't paying any attention to these, um, these books that they just sort of put out into the universe. Uh, they didn't have newsstand coverage, and I was still buying a fair amount of comics on the newsstand in 92, 93, 94. I was a newsstand customer as long as they had them. I thought the newsstand was a great, it was, it was a fantastic delivery system. It had charm uh, that the dedicated retailer just can't match. And now that you don't have the comparison, uh, I bet that stands out. Just like walking into a store being like, well, not every store gets every comic book. So maybe if you go into a store from out of town, you'll find something that you don't usually see. That was a fun part of traveling outside your area. If you lived in a place that only had two or three places to buy comic books regularly, which was me, uh, you didn't always see everything even that was uh, uh, bound for the newsstand. Anyway, I'm just babbling. The point being, well, you know that I'm babbling. That's why you're watching. So, oh yeah, and I didn't even realize that this was the, the next issue blurb because it just ends on like a one-sixth size panel. That's, <laughs> this couldn't be, and it's got like this weird janky dinosaur monster. My goodness, if this ran in 2000 AD in 1992, you'd still be talking about it. It would have like five sequel series, two of them by Chris Weston. Oh, and this is the series that I remember because this was early 
Gary Frank on this this Motormouth character who sometimes usually had this uh, guy named Kill Power and it was sort of an attempt to put you know two l l lower tier characters together and it did work for the most part I think for a year. Uh, yeah, there's a Kill Power fellow. So you just put a uh, a spunky teenage girl who dresses in a r provocative way with, uh, you know, an older guy with uh, lots of firearms. And then you have put them up against the X-Men and you get a young Gary Frank to draw it, although I think he only did the first eight issues. But this channel is no stranger to me talking about how much I enjoy Gary Frank. This is Gary Frank at, at, at 1992. And you see, he already had just, he was already like really good right out of the oven in 1992. I, I love this character. I wish she would show up more. She never shows up for anything. Nothing. And you'd think that someone, like, at some point, would have picked up some fondness or familiarity with this character, but she's never been used for anything. Oh, well. Oh, and... <laughs> See, they were kind of unorthodox. They just put the bullpen buttons on the back cover, which, I don't know, maybe maybe they were spiting Fleer Ultra that month. Maybe they were late with uh, the, the payment. And, oh, they were doing the cool meters Oh, the cool meters Do we miss the cool meters I don't know if we miss the, the, the cool meters it's, it's an interesting time capsule, certainly. They were really excited about Blue Man Group. And Squirrel Girl was on here as the second hot, coolest thing, which uh, I don't know. We can look back on that and wonder in hindsight whether that was a sincere ranking. Nuclear families, oh, some Ren and Stimpy, weird cultural cross currents here. North Star Expo, oh, because this was around Alpha Flight 120, which was also part of the, I mean, that book was uh, very, it, it sold more copies because of that, let's say. You know, they were just, a lot of people were selling comics with gimmicks at the time. And the, and the books with the good artists were getting overlooked. Uh, long sideburns on men, long bangs on women. Above to courtesy of Beverly Hills 90210. My goodness. Do kids today even know what that is? I lived through it, and I barely know what it is. Uh, spontaneous combustion, which is like a decade too old to be a reference to Spinal Tap. Murphy Brown as a mom is way down here. Wow, who was writing these? Corduroy pants, bottle tap water, CD long boxes. That's true. By 1992, we were all sick of those things. All right, everyone, even if you don't use them, you know what a CD is. It's a little... Uh, round disc, and it goes in a plastic case. You've probably seen one, even if you've never used one. Uh, and for the first five, six or so years of the CD's life as a major product category, they were all sold in these long, uh, they were twice as long as the CD itself, and it was a little cardboard case. You can guess why, uh, but eventually they, they, figured out they could do the plastic cases and that's what the industry moved over for because uh, paper waste, paper and plastic waste in the CD industry was actually a national cause at the time. I'm 100% dead serious. There was discourse in the media about it. Um, thanks partially to Pearl Jam, but that's, I don't want to get too much into that. I know I'm old. You don't have to remind me. And fast food. Yeah, well, you know. All right. Let's read some Batman. You know, I bought a lot of Batman comics in my life. I don't consider myself a Batman person necessarily. I, I'm a fan of many of the artists who draw the character. And because he's the title that, that sells, always, rain or shine, he gets really good people to draw him. So I, I end up reading a lot of Batman. This is one of my very favorite Batman runs. It's kind of underread, I think. It was a big deal at the time, because Kelly Jones, uh, he was different. He was like nothing else 
going on at the time. He was on the stands in 92 doing stuff. He was already as as weird as this by middle of 1995. Uh, he did the, the Vampire Batman graphic novels, which were really big for a hot minute. They sold a lot of copies of Vampire Batman. He did uh, Dead Man books, which weren't as popular as the Vampire Batman books, but were really nice and uh, could have redefined the character's look, but people more or less went back to the Neil Adams look. Uh, but Batman really was a case of uh, an artist with a unique style in his prime, getting more or less free reign on a character that really rewards imaginative artists. And maybe you wouldn't think it because it's just a, it's just a guy who uh, runs around the city in a cape, but there you go. There's the history of the comics industry. This is a very interesting comic for another reason, because this guy right here, who you probably recognize as Mr. Uh, Swamp Thing, he didn't appear in comics with the Comics Code. He just, he didn't. But he did a couple years, or a couple times over the years. He appeared once in Green Lantern at Green Lantern's funeral, he appeared in this issue of Batman, and I don't think he made any other appearances in the mainline books. But there's a this is a Killer Croc two-parter where the gimmick, and it didn't last for very long, but, but Killer Croc was becoming more bestial, more beast-like. And that had been sort of happening in the books for a while, and that's not really been a big part of his character for, um, I don't think, for a while. But that was like the arc of like, uh, that period for the, for the character's development. And so he basically just, he breaks out of prison and runs into the swamp. And then he runs into Swamp Thing. So it's not, it's more a book about, if I recall correctly, it's a book about Batman chasing him. And it's interesting because the, you know, who shows up at the end. But it's just, I mean, you know, Kelly Jones, he would go on to do more Swamp Thing. He did, the, he did the Convergence Swamp Thing series, which is not the first Swamp Thing series I would recommend to anyone. I, I don't know. Uh, it's very, well, it's, it's interesting. I'll just say it's, it's interesting. One of the more interesting Convergence books. There were some good Convergence tie-ins. There were some tie-ins that were much better than the main series to Convergence. And I'm getting off the track here. I'm just sitting here looking at Bon Jovi, just suddenly realizing that the 90s hit them like a cricket mallet. Jeez. So anyway, Swamp Things, that's the name of it. And uh, They even they put the Swamp Thing created by Lynn, Lynn Wine and Bernie Wrightson right up, right up front there. Um, you, you knew it was special because they were all numbered. The creative team clearly had a, put a lot into them and really enjoyed working together, so they numbered their collaborations along the run. So this was Doug Mench, Kelly Jones, John Beatty, seven. I can't remember if John ba Beatty stayed the whole run, but it was a stable creative team through the whole period. I loved it. I loved it. This was one of my favorite books. And man, you know, if you're not, if you're not ready for Kelly Jones, uh, but no one draws like this. He's got little bits and pieces, obviously. Bernie Wrightson is, is right up there. But Bernie Wrightson, you know, Bernie Wrightson had a little bit more cartoony in him, maybe, than he might give credit for, but nothing like this. It's interesting. And, you know, there's some Mignola as well, I think. And maybe even a little bit of, you know, Rob Liefeld. You see it sometimes in setups like that. He's someone who had a number of interesting interesting influences uh, that he channeled in a maybe uh, counterintuitive way. Certainly his vampire Batman stuff, it, it's far out. It's not my favorite Batman book by any means, but it's worth a flip through. It looks like no other Batman book you've ever seen. 
There's a reason why that character stuck in the stuck in the popular imagination. He only did like three graphic novels with him. My goodness, this is who's coloring this? Greg Gregory Wright, another absolutely top shelf creator. I like these greens. I like these greens and blues. Very early 90s DC. You know, they, they succumbed to ugly 90s coloring just like everyone else did, but man, oh man. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. My goodness. Look at that Batman. Look at, look at that. I'm just saying look at it over and over again. It's just so, it's so nice. And you look and you, and you see all sorts of intricate hatching that isn't necessarily visible on the first glance because it's really, really tight in there. Yeah, maybe there's a little bit of Kevin O'Neill. But he, he did well in the image period. You know, there's always, or at least there used to be, always room for a handful of guys at Marvel and DC who could do something different and weird. You know, Sam Keith sort of, I feel like, came out of the same uh, mold here in terms of doing something that no one else was doing with more of a, more of a cartoony, more of a, maybe a horror-influenced feel, which wasn't necessarily something that, you know, I think Todd McFarlane got there. Uh, but he didn't start out there. Oh my goodness. And these long ears, no one drew the ears this this good. I can't deal with the short ears. It just looks like, I don't know, are you like a Scottish fold man? <laughs> I want to see these little big honking, you know, pokey things. I love that uh, STP. That's just such a wonderfully evocative sound effect. Oh, that brown water that's... Brown water with the blue shadow. My goodness. So he's, you know, Batman, he's out of his... He's out of his element. But maybe, you know, he fits in a little bit more than he probably feels comfortable with. But he's he's still tracking someone through the, through the jungle, through the swamp. Uh, ah, Game Gear Genesis. I didn't have those. Although, you know, I got to say, that version of Batman, there's a reason why we're so attached to it. Watching it come out every day, a new episode. My goodness, there was a period on TV where they were just putting out a new episode of this every day for weeks on end. We ate good. We ate so good. We didn't even know how good we had it. Oh, look at how evocative, creepy, these, oh, these colors. This is just such a beautiful comic book. Two absolutely gorgeous comic books. That's it. This is an absolutely gorgeous comic book day on this channel here. No pikers allowed. Gary Erskine and Kelly Jones. Oh, just look at that. Look at how grumpy that Batman is. And the, this croc is so far out. I mean, this looks kind of like an image guy's drawing, and yet somehow, somehow it works because it's just warped in the same way. Oh, it's just so nice. Oh, I like, like this just very, very closely rendered sole of a boot in the guy's face. And there's a very, very familiar uh, staging for that particular move. Oh, wow. Wow. Go run and tell your mother to get in, get in gear because she's going to miss this. Look at that. Oh, and these, all these details, these turtles. These perfectly drawn turtles and this little cartoony snake. 
and a frog. Man, this, this is a far out swamp thing, you gotta admit. So he basically stumbles along like, what are you doing? Why are you having a fight in, in my home? And so he, he basically just wind, winds him up with, with roots so they stop fighting. Oh, and then he gives Croc one of his weird psychedelic uh, plants and he's, oh, he, what? Yeah, he's, he's sending Croc on some sort of trip with this uh, very 70s green, early 80s, this is, this is these type of color holes or something he saw in, in the Alan Moore, John Tuttlebin swamp thing, a lot. Oof. And he, so he punches Swamp Thing. That doesn't go as well as he'd like. You know, I have to admit, Swamp Thing is one of my favorite characters. Oh, what was I saying about Wrightson? That's a, that's a straight Wrightson uh, panel right there. Uh, what was I just saying? Swamp Thing is one of my favorite characters. I, one of the, the joys in life is every now and again when he crashes into another hero series and he just clowns them. He did it in an, he did it to Batman again not that long ago. Uh, he just shows up and he's like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> like, all you did was get your arm dirty. <laughs> and if ever he becomes a threat to the world of man, I will make you aware of it. So basically he's just like, maybe this, maybe what you've been trying isn't working. Maybe let him just stick around with me for a while. And I think he did stick around for a little bit, but, you know, they can't do many. I guess they didn't have... They didn't have any intention of making him a Vertigo character, which is kind of interesting. I mean, they went there with... Uh, you know, Garth Ennis did a Killer Croc series uh, just a couple years ago. But they weren't about to make a Batman villain a, a Vertigo character at the time. So they weren't really setting him up for anything. This uh, I don't remember when he appeared again, but... Uh, I can't even remember if Swamp Thing was in that story. So it's it's just gorgeous. And here's more of them year one annuals that we were looking at last time around. So you can see where the stuff in this box primarily came from. What era? So uh, the Green Lantern annual, uh, Ron Mars was uh, writing it. He was the guy who was doing the main title. Ha Mester Loeb's is writing the Hawkman annual. Huh. Mester Loeb's, Wagner and Geis? My goodness. Yeah, that's the weird thing about Hawkman. Every now and again, you look back and you see some Rando Hawkman series as an absolutely sterling creative team. And I'm sorry. It's Hawkman. You're not going to get me happy about Hawkman. But he's got some good artists drawing him. Oh, Vengeance of Bane, too. I have to admit, I like this. I, I like this. I like the first Vengeance of Bane. I like the set of the second Vengeance of Bane. I just liked how these men, Dixon, Nolan, Barreto, no one else has really quite got, I think, what they were getting with this character. And he's been in some very good stories since, don't get me wrong. But he's not this character anymore. I mean, this character, to a degree, you know, what was there to, what was, what stories were there to tell with Bane after he broke Batman's back? His arc was actually interesting as far as that went, but it didn't leave you a lot of room to go anywhere with it. All right, so what What next? We looked at two very nice comic books. I want to keep our streak going here. Okay, here's one. I picked this out specifically because it's a gorgeous-looking comic book. Uh, this is from the uh, 19, uh, 1980s and 90s Silver Surfer run, which... You know, Silver Surfer has a character who doesn't sell comic books, but this series lasted like 12 years. And it sold pretty well through most of it. It was readable through just about the entire run, and it had some really good creators. This is the first issue of, and we'll get back to that page. This is the first issue of, oh, just give me the credits. <laughs> are you on the last page like a chump? Where are you? I just want to make sure I don't say something stupid. Now, this was the first issue of J.M. Dematisse's rather... Oh, it's right here. George Perez and J.M. Dematisse. George Perez had just written the last year of the book, which is 
kind of a, a weird, uh, sort of a one-off at the time, it seemed like, because he just wanted to to write the book. So he had a solid year as a writer for uh, Tom Granberg did part of it. I can't remember off the top. I want to say maybe Scott Eaton, early Scott Eaton. Don't, don't hold me to that. If I'm wrong, I'll actually look it up and put it on the screen. And if I don't put anything up, I was right. Um, so anyway, this was the last issue of George Perez's run as writer and the first issue of James de Matisse's run as writer. And James de Matisse was the writer through the end of the book. And this is issue 123. It lasts into the 40s. So the de Matisse run is, is very, uh, by, you know, by modern standards, it's a lengthy run. And he had good art through it. He had... Ron Garney to begin with, Ron Garney and Bob Wyachek. And towards the end, he had a little fella you might recognize named J.J. Muth. Yes, he did a run on Silver Surfer. It's a, it is some weird looking comic books. Uh, they don't read like you might expect J.J. Muth's Silver Surfer to look like. Uh, interesting looking comic books. Maybe I'll try to dig some out at some point. Because it's not a very well-read uh, run at all. Neither is this. And this is Ron Garney. Now, Ron Garney at this point uh, could do no wrong with me. Uh, because after kind of liking him for years, like I sort of thought he was pretty good, oh, good on Ghost Rider. I like Ghost Rider well enough. Uh, I really liked his Captain America. His Captain America... His Captain America run, even though I don't think it sold anywhere near as much as his Ghost Rider run, that seemed to be the run that really established him. Because it wasn't, he wasn't just doing a run on, you know, a later run on Ghost Rider in the early 90s. He did, a, he did that brief as a less than a year run of Captain America with Mark Wade that was extraordinarily popular. It didn't necessarily save the book from Heroes Reborn, which is its whole... I've discussed it before at length in various other formats, not getting into the foo for about that. But he came out the other side of that Captain America run, uh, really um, enfranchised, I felt. Uh, his work was suddenly a lot better. It just seemed like... He had a growth spurt work that year working with Mark Wade, I think. Uh, really helped him somehow. I don't know how. Uh, I need to go back and read it is what I need to do. But by the time he got to Silver Surfer, which was the book they gave him after Captain America was unceremoniously taken out basically from under Wade and Garney's feet. Long story. Long story. And he got to draw Silver Surfer. And I think, I want to say he wanted to draw Silver Surfer. I think this was, if I recall correctly, he was excited about this project. And it certainly looks, this is an excellent looking comic book. This is a gorgeous looking comic book. If Ron Garney isn't someone who's been on your radar, let me tell you something. This, this is one of the nicest looking runs. And it's not very long. He doesn't draw very many Silver Surfer comic books. I think... In hindsight, he, it scratched a niche for him, and it, it maybe didn't sell as well as something else he could do. I don't remember what he did. Oh, no, he went back to Captain America. That's what it was. He went back to Captain America when it was part of Heroes Reborn. And that run, I mean, it certainly looked very good. It probably wasn't, and, you know, it wasn't as strong as the first time around, but that's not on the artist. It still looked dynamite. And even his Hulk books. I think we've even looked at an issue of what, his Hulk at some point. He drew a very nice Hulk. I'm just, I just like his work in general. Really do. Just all around excellent artist. And this page is, uh, I guess these are, these are just uh, character sketches he was doing in Silver Surfer. Or I don't know, maybe these are from later in the story. But they're basically dedicating the first page to Mark Grunewald here. And, you know, this was right after he died, right after that period where Marvel had torn itself apart. And after all that, after the bankruptcy even, they had the ignominy of having... Oh, wait, I'm trying to remember the timing, whether this was right before the bankruptcy or right after the bankruptcy. But basically, 
they were in the dumps for the longest time. And there was a sense, certainly not something that was hidden in the fan press, uh, it was really a body blow to Marvel's self-image, if nothing else, to have what they saw as the crown jewel stolen out from under them because they they loved Captain America, but maybe they'd loved Captain America to death a little bit because it wasn't selling what it could. And at the time, the logic, you know, you can't say the logic didn't make a lot of sense in terms of these characters are underperforming. And I think the years since have shown, yes, Captain America and Iron Man were significantly underperforming in the 1990s uh, relative to how popular they could be. And there were just, there were hard feelings all around because of how it was done. But in hindsight, you can't say that a shakeup of some seismic proportion wasn't called for, because the fact is it really hurt Marvel to lose those characters for no other reason than suddenly the, the, the New York offices of Marvel had a shortage on the bulletin board. They, they couldn't publish Fantastic Four comics for a year, so they had to sort of improvise, and that's where you got Deadpool getting his first solo book. And that's where the, the Thunderbolts come from as well. And one of the lesser remembered gems of that period was this run on Silver Surfer, where, like I say, it's not that well, I mean, admittedly, if I say it's not that well remembered of a Silver Surfer run, how many Silver Surfer runs do most people walk around with in the back of their pocket? They're not... I recognize most people are not as committed to the whys and wherefores of the Silver Surfer as I am. But man, look at this. Look at this. You haven't even seen the Silver Surfer yet for three pages, although you first see him in the reflection of this fighter jet pilot who's rushing out because they got a bogey on their tail. And look who it is. Man. And what I like about this is you can you can see he's really uh, he's really a student of the character because he is the first person to come in to draw the Silver Surfer as if he was a character who had once been drawn by Mobius, which is maybe a odd way of saying it, but it took a while for Marvel to metabolize the two comics that Mobius ever drew for them, and finally. Finally, someone was that ambitious to reach for the top shelf. But it's not necessarily dissimilar from Ron Lim, because he's got some of the he's got some of the Mobius. It almost reads like he's also been paying a lot of attention to Ron Lim and the way Ron Lim drew this, you know, chrome finish that he'd never really been drawn before with, or at least not consistently. It's you know, it's very far from the John Buscema and even the Kirby Surfer. There was a real alienness to it. I mean, look at this. Look at this splash page. A sense of motion, this sense of motion, even though the main character is upside down on the, the front spread. Look at that. Oh, it's the Silver Surfer. Well, they're, these, these flyboys are realizing, oh, wow, they're going to shoot at him? Oh. Why would you do that? I, I guess maybe they had a quota or, or something. Oh, and the... Oh, this picks up on X-Men Unlimited 14, which, if I recall correctly, George... I want to say George Perez wrote that, which is uh, from the X-Men... Un, it was a quarterly with extra long stories, and they actually tried to get decent art for it every now and again. Oh, I can't remember who drew the one that had the X-Men with the Silver Surfer. But yeah, they were making a big push for, you know, let's see if we can sell some issues of Silver Surfer here. Let's put a decent artist on them. Let's, uh, let's get a good writer. Let me make one thing extremely clear, Captain. To you and your superiors, the Silver Surfer answers to no one. <laughs> uh. Wow, cardzillion card vending machine? What is this? Oh, they were. This is an advertisement for the vending machine selling Power Rangers cards. I don't. Oh, and Beetleborgs. They were pushing the Beetleborgs too. 
Man, what were they? What were they doing in the mid '90s with the children's entertainment? Oh my goodness! Look at this. Just take it all in, folks. Take it all in. My God, look at that. People bring their A-game to the Silver Surfer. That's one thing you have to say about it. people, even Silver Surfer comics that I don't like. The artist almost always brings their A-game. You know, this character has a pedigree. They didn't let just anyone draw him for the longest time. Marshall Rogers did a run. Maybe one of the um, more underread Silver Surfer runs. Possibly my f personal favorite Silver Surfer run. I like Mike Alred's Silver Surfer. I don't necessarily like those stories that much. So he's here. He's basically reacting to the events of Onslaught and Heroes Are Born, which was basically everyone thought the Fantastic Four and a bunch of other people were dead. So he shows up in town. And, oh, yeah, he's having trouble. He's going through one of his periodic, uh, I'm feeling very inhuman and all my emotions are banished. He does that every now and again. And then he'll show up a couple years down the line and he'll be everyone's friend again. I, I'll be honest with you, I much prefer when the Silver Surfer is drawn as more or less on friendly terms with everyone on Earth when because it just, he was on Earth for a long time and he got to know a lot of these, you know, he's friends with the Fantastic Four. He shouldn't be acting all weird around his pals. I know that's a very, very small nitpick of mine, but so we're just flashing back to the very first Silver Surfer story. Galactus comes to Earth. Fantastic Four fight the Punisher. The Lee and Kirby Punisher, not the Frank Castle dude. Actually, a cool-looking robot design. He shows up every once in a blue moon because it's fun to have another character named the Punisher in a story. So he's basically just looking at, watching what Reed Richards' own account of that first adventure was. Yeah, and then no uh, captioning at all, just this four, this four panels of him walking through the, uh, the house, and he sees Alicia Masters, in a picture, and he gets back on his board. And that's significant uh, for a couple, I realize this scene is significant in a couple ways because very soon the Thunderbolts were gonna take over during their year of actually being villains uh, when they were under, dis under disguise as, as heroes, they took over the fan Fantastic Four's headquarters because the Fantastic Four were dead, or gone, dead and gone. And then, you know, they, got, they came back and then that was the end of the first year on Thunderbolts. But also, Alicia would go on to be a supporting character. Yeah, and here she is. She would go on to be a supporting character pretty much for this whole run and has a very uh, much a fling with the Silver Surfer, which makes sense because uh, she was just coming out of a period, I think, where she wasn't really with Ben through the DeFalco Ryan years. I don't think for most of it, at least, because she was just coming back after having been kidnapped by the Skrulls for years. Uh, when, when that Skrull had been married to Johnny Storm. So she was in sort of a weird position with the Fantastic Four family. So there was no reason why. Oh, and here he's drawing a very Kirby. Very, I mean, he's taking these panels uh, from the original story and giving us this very classical Kirby-esque Silver Surfer without all these, you know, Ron Lim, you know, Ron Lim smuggled in from 80s, uh, I'm assuming 80s anime, how they, you know, drew gleaming machinery in those. A very early anime influence in the, uh, in the Marvel comics there. Man, look at this, look at this. Look at how nice this is. Ooh. My goodness, this shaky line on this close-up of his face. Oh, it's, this is just, this is next level stuff. There's even maybe some Tom Grinberg in here. Maybe not, you know, a lot of people's first, uh, but he drew a fair amount of Silver Surfer comic books. Just a, a nice looking, nice looking 
comic book. And here's him drawn a little bit like John Buscema because there's a few panels of uh, Silver Surfer number five. And this character, this Bernard Har Harper character, actually came back recently for uh, uh, another Silver Surfer series. Oh, and there's a bear. Say hi to the bear. Um, and there's this character who's about to become involved with the Silver Surfer. And here's a robot he's going to fight. Hey, come on. Little man's trying to break up the world over here. Uh, well, I should probably recording this. Let's probably stop recording a video here. And I think he's telling me that I need to go throw the crinkly mat mouse around with him for a few minutes. So um, we've had a lot of fun here. I wanted to go back to that bullpen bulletins. You're not. Oh, Garfield Subway Kids Pack. Collect all four buckets. Uh, I wanted to go back to that bullpen Boltons. That's still a radio car ad. Where is it? Oh, right up front. Uh, yeah, Perez was doing a fair amount of work for Mainline Marvel at the time because he inked inked the Spider Man. I don't think he's ever actually he ever actually drew, pardon me, a Spider Man series. He actually. Uh, drew the series of covers on Marvel Tales that reprinted the original Hobgoblin story. So he had an, he does have an association with that one Spider-Man character. Uh, oh, they were trying another Marvel tryout book. Wonder if anything ever came of that. Uh, they're talking about more company, intercompany crossovers. Uh, Team X, Team 7, wow. That's, uh, well, I got Larry Hammond with Steve Epting and Matt Ryan. Steve Epting really, you know, he was coming off as Avengers. I liked him as Avengers. Uh, oh, Spider-Man Gen 13, if I recall correctly, that was, oh, Stuart Eminen. I wanted to say that was early um, Dotson work, but Stuart Eminen, you see why it sticks together in my head. Stuart Eminen and Ken Smith, that's a great team. I don't think I have that. All right. Oh, this was the 101 Ways to End the Clone Saga. That's a weird comic book. Maybe I'll pull that out one of these days. Although maybe that was in that other box. I don't remember. <laughs> what are you doing over there? We only made it through three comics. But man, three very nice looking comics. We took our time. We took our time. I babbled as I usually do. What are you doing? Anyway, stick around. I've got tons of videos. Uh, tell all your friends. Spread the videos around. Uh, tell all your pals at your comic book store about this crazy woman who fights with a cat online. Um, ah, there we go again. Uh, check out my TikTok site. The videos are also on Instagram. I do daily comic book reviews. I do I cover just about any, anything and everything on that show. Uh, I got a podcast with Claire Napier. It's called Utter Madness. We talk about... Um, uh, God. Uh, we talk about Top Cow Comics, Mark Silvestri, Michael Turner, uh, Darkness, Witchblade, Cyberforce, all that good stuff. I gotta go play with this guy. Um, just have a great day. Be, be good to each other. Please go to the Patreon. Uh, check it out. Check out the Patreon so I can maybe uh, not be quite so blindingly poor all the time. Anyway, have a wonderful day. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to each other. Be kind to kittens so they don't grow up to be little SOBs. Have a wonderful day.